Um, you know, cause, cause when, when you step out on faith on something like this, um, the belief is, is definitely a go, you mm -hmm. know, you wouldn't step out on faith if, if you aren't clearly thinking that it's going to be a hundred percent sure thing. Yeah. And, um, and, but it does, it does take time. It Hey everyone, this is Amber Key, and you're listening to a Bright Idea podcast, a show that sits down with entrepreneurs to hear about the aha moment that launched their businesses. Life has many twists and turns, and sometimes we end up on a path we never knew existed. When we think about entrepreneurship, we often forget that many business owners began their careers on a path having nothing to do with their current business. In last week's episode with venture capital investor Tori Orr, she stated, businesses should come out of a need to solve a problem. Take Lavetta Goldsboro, for example. Lavetta spent 30 years as a pharmaceutical sales representative. As a pharmaceutical sales representative, she would host doctors and their nurses at dinners and events to help build rapport and talk to them about her product with the goal of closing a deal. Through years of working with doctors, she learned how to carry herself, work a room, and speak in the most optimal way to earn their business. At events that involved food, she noticed that many of her clients lacked proper etiquette, knowledge of how to order wine, and what to and not to share in a group setting. From there, Lavetta discovered that she had all of these skills and decided to develop courses that could help others reach their potential. Style, grace, refinement, and professionalism are words that clients of My Optimal Image use to describe its founder, Lavetta Goldsboro. Through education and empowerment via individual and group activities and trainings, My Optimal Image helps leaders, entrepreneurs, and anyone looking to achieve to maximize their potential and quality of life. Well, actually, my background has been in professionally, it has been in sales. Right out of college, I went to um, the College of William and Mary, but before that, I went to Richard Bland College. That's um, in Dinwiddie County, um, Virginia. I've had the opportunity to, to work my first career for really a, light, a, a full time. And, um, and it's given me a, a good springboard to, to go into another career. But like I mentioned, um, so high school, then college, and then I went right into the College of William and Mary and that allowed me to literally uh, graduate early. So. So that was good, but my major was business, business management. So I've always wanted to be in business for myself. My father was was an entrepreneur. He worked at the factory in Petersburg, Brown and Williamson Tobacco, but he was a skilled person, and he had he was an electrician, an electrical contractor, actually. So. He had his own business, so that always motivated motivated me to want to be in business for myself. And then alongside, my mom um, taught business classes in the high school, and then she continued on to teach in college. So, so them paired up, being steeped in a in a household that um, business was of the optimal. That's what got me interested in being um, a business owner. So in that pursuit, it was always, okay, well, what do, exactly do I wanna do? And I've always liked um, cosmetology. I've always liked um, styling and clothes and, and fashion merchandising. And those were some of the uh, classes I took in high school. And um, so that's always been an interest of mine. So when I was in high school, you know, I said, well, I can just go to the trade school and get my cosmetology degree. And my parents were like, no way, you are college material. So you are definitely going to go to college. So I did do that, but I still had that passion that I wanted to practice cosmetology. So after I finished college, I made it my business to go to, to beauty school part-time until I got my um, cosmetology license. So, so that's what set my pace on what I wanted to do. So I worked behind the chair for a bit, 
part-time and my full-time jobs was in sales. I actually, I initially worked for Brown and Williams of Tobacco Corporation in sales, gave me some good, some nice foundational sales skills. And then I went on to be a pharmaceutical sales representative. And that's something that I always wanted to do as well. So, so I've had an opportunity as far as corporate wise to go to the top, you know, um, be on the top sales team to be a top sales award, reward um, winner, award winner nationally. So I've been at the top of my game, but it has really given me the background knowledge to um, be that person that that has honed skills on being or making the best representation of myself. So, so that brings me to my optimal image and putting all those skills together, the cosmetology, the um, um, etiquette trainer protocol and etiquette trainer certified, a sommelier, so um, a wine educator. And so bringing all those skills together has been the foundation for my optimal image. Obviously, you spent so much time in the pharmaceutical sales rep space, so you grow into some of those skills. But I wanted to know if in your background growing up was etiquette and protocol. Like, what did that mean in your household? Oh, my goodness, Amber. That, that, um, well, my, I, I still hear regularly my dad always saying to me and my brother, is that proper? You know, is that the proper way to do this? Is that the right approach? And um, and that just just continues to ring in my ear on a regular basis. And my mom was a lady of grace. Actually, her name is or was she recently passed, um, Gracie. So, you know, with the proper, with the grace, what with doing things in order, um, maintaining. Um, things in order that that's really has been the foundation to me being where I am and um, the inner working the core desire to do things the right way and to know the proper way to do it and and what's very important to me is not just thinking you're doing the right thing but being trained to know that you know that you're doing the right thing. And um, and I, I love to be in the company of folks that want to do things correctly. So brought up that way and um, my, my desire to continue that legacy of my parents and that, that brings me to my optimal image and helping people to that want to pursue that for themselves, you know, to represent themselves in the best manner um, in the pharmaceutical industry. They saw me as that company. So I had, uh, I had to present myself well. I had to know the product inside and out, know the competition inside and out, and be able to answer questions according to the representation of that manufacturer. So it was a it, it 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 was a big responsibility. And I take it at heart to know the correct answers. And and I'm a I'm the type of person now if I don't know, I'm not gonna fake it. You know, I can acquiesce and say, you know what, that's something that I will definitely research and bring it back to you. So it's very important when um, things are on your shoulders, responsibilities on, on your shoulders is to know the right answer, but be willing to know the difference when you don't. Mm -hmm. I like that. And I, I think about, I think that's so important, especially not just in a sales role, but mm -hmm. in a career in general. And I think that some of the listeners who are listening in there just getting into their careers. I think that it could be very intimidating establishing yourself, speaking up when you have an idea or when you think something is wrong or um, 
you know, advocating for yourself in the workplace. I mean, the list goes on. I can remember um, being in a sales position and um, I had to take clients to a Wizards game and we had to um, host them in this uh, suite. And I remember I was like 20, I had just turned 25 and everyone is twice my age. And I, and it was only me and I had to command the room and schmooze these people so that I could get a sale at the end of the night. And these are some of the things that when you get into corporate, you're kind of like thrown to the wolves. Like no one really teaches you these things or they lead you to believe that you, that it takes time and experience to be able to, like you're, like you're mentioning, walk into a room with some of these doctors and know exactly what to do. And so I think that um, the fact that you are now explaining my optimal image, um, that that's something that you're, you're trying to aim to do. But I, I want to kind of get into like, when did you first have the vision of my optimal image? Was it while you were still selling? Well, actually, Amber, the first, I would, I would say the first point that I, that I, to really see this clearly is when I was um, doing a project uh, for my MBA studies. And um, one of the projects that I did was, and this was back in um, 2012, was um, online charm school. (laughs) So so, so I had to develop the, the idea of online and market it, market it. And, and this was really before the online push was really in style, you know, way before COVID. And, and um, so it was, it was really an idea that I had that this would be a great way to reach out to people beyond my geographical reach. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, that, that was the beginning of the thoughts of reaching people, reaching them where they are. Um, and the charm school, I I felt like that would, that would, um, focus on in a group of folks that would need it the most when they're, you know, just young teenagers, preteens, and then their parents would see the value. Mm-hmm. That was a part of my marketing is, is not so much to market to my ultimate consumer, mm-hmm. but to market to the parents of the consumer that I would be teaching to. And so you wanted to teach young people about etiquette and about protocol and how to just um, conduct yeah, themselves. Conduct- yeah, conduct themselves and dining is a big portion of that. Mm-hmm. How to navigate a dining table, how to manage yourself at a dining table, to know the conversations at a dining table, um, how to convey. A lot of times when I speak of etiquette, the 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 first thing that goes into I think a person's head is, oh, I know how to set a table. I know how to. But it's more than that. It's more of how to manage yourself at the table, how to how to convey, how to know your continental style and your American style and the difference and um, things that you do, the do's and don't of a dining table, the conversations, the do's and don'ts of at a dining table. Um, so. So yeah, these are these are some of the components that is is very important, and quite honestly, um, actually, Amber, some of my biggest offenders were the doctors. You would think that people that are professionals to that level will would you know know would know how to manage themselves in a dining situation. One of the big um, portions of a pharmaceutical rep is to develop or to make an environment to talk with the physicians. Mm -hmm. And one of the big um, ways to do that is to set dining situations. And quite often these situations would happen at lunchtime in the offices. 
So as a, a rep, you know, I would bring in lunch and that's, that would that not only for the physicians, for the whole staff. So that would set the, the environment to have clinical discussions while the doctors and the staff are in their downtime. Mm-hmm. Um, but as the pharmaceutical representative, the manufacturer representative, I would have to bring that all together. But in that, I would clearly one-on-one see the offenses or the the faux pas that um, were practiced in dining. All right, so give us a few. Okay, so one thing is holding the utensils correctly. That's something that many people just do not know how to do. They just don't care. And um, and sharing, oversharing, just don't care. Um, like oversharing in conversation. Well, no, oversharing, like sharing food or um, even, even some of the conversations were uh, offbeat. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I was like, oh my goodness, just imagine what, is needed as far as etiquette education. So that was a dining situation that we would set is in the office, but then there are programs that would 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 be a way to get doctors out of the office. And, and those were centered around dining situations too. So it would be a case of um, taking physicians out, say, maybe have a a, a special specialist speak on a, a particular um, um, pain management, say, mm-hmm. and and the product that I was uh, that I promote is a pain management product, but they would have thought leaders. We would have thought leaders to talk to physicians to um, to to practice or to use a particular um, product for a particular pain uh, management medication. So so that would be in a, at a program outside the office, which included at a restaurant. And again, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Big offenders. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, the um, etiquette as far as wine and over- indulging and you know things that are that you would think are so common Mm -hmm. that is where um, the etiquette is needed and then as the host because I was in a host role then I would need to know how to uh, manage wine how to order wine um, and how to uh, make the situation um, at its best. So, so that is an area that a person would need to know how to manage themselves as far as the professional and the representative. And that right. is that is an area of uh, area of opportunity for people to get trained. It sounds like you had many points where you were like, I, there's a need and I need to fix it. But was there a specific aha moment that led you to pull the trigger and launch my optimal image? The thing that really helped me get a, a, a jump on this is that when I was literally in the offices and building rapport, I had like almost like a little notebook of everybody's name who they were, the front desk, the back staff, the nurses, each doctor's nurse. So when I would call into the office, I had that rapport and I could ask for specific people. I could say what I need specifically. Um, Karen, can you connect me back to Dr. Smith? I got this um special um, promotion that I want for this particular pr- uh, patient that we talked about the last time I was in there. So I had specifics. Yeah. And and so that meant I was able to make my rounds from remotely from my dining room table. 
So I said, well, you know what? If I can do that with um, my pharmaceutical products and things that the company wants me to talk about, guess what? I can do that virtually with my optimal image and incorporate online classes and really reach more people than I can reach when I'm doing it in person. Mm -hmm. So that's what really made me say, well, this is a this is an opportunity to really give this a go. And not only have my optimal image in person, but also expand and reach out to other people all over the country, really outside of the country, it could be, because it's a virtual situation. So so that's what really gave me the push. I've I, you know, I had the training already. I had the um, education, the experience by being the professional representative. Yeah. Um, but that really was a push to say, you know what, you can expand this above and beyond what you what you have done in person. So that that that's what gave me that aha moment and that push to say, I can get this done now. Yeah. And so once you said, I can get this done now, and you made the pursuit to start my optimal image as your new uh, business, can you talk to us about some of the services that you offer? Okay. Well, my optimal image, um, well, I'll say this person in person, I do um, etiquette training, etiquette and protocol training through my county adult education classes. I mean, uh, adult education um, in the county. Um, but online, I do um, wine education classes, etiquette training and protocol classes. And I also have opportunities for one-on-one -on -one um, coaching sessions with people that have maybe have a specific thing that's coming up that they want to talk about. They want to want to have their specific questions. They send me um, information beforehand. And if it's something that I need to research or get a little bit more about, mm -hmm. I can have that ready for them when we do our one-on-one. -on -one. So I love that it is in person so you can uh, reach the Richmond audience, which for the listeners, you are based out of Richmond, yes. um, at Richmond, Virginia. And then I think what we also saw in the pandemic was the rise in online courses and how creating this sort of evergreen content is not only it's lucrative for you because if people can go ahead and purchase the class um, and keep coming back to it, but you can also offer a plethora of different services within within these videos. Um, so I, I love that. Exactly, Amber. And when you say evergreen, I do also offer evergreen versus live. So evergreen is um, a class that I do have on Why This Wine on my website, myoptimalimage.com, where people can uh, buy that class and, and go at their own pace. Mm -hmm. And of course, they have the class so they can refer back to it and learn um, wine tech. Well, it really is foundational wine information. So one of my favorite uh, things that I like to talk about, one of my favorite um, portions in that class is what do your five senses have to do with the five S's of wine tasting? So I talk about your five senses, which you everybody's familiar with. And we all have that. So we do have the basic foundational pieces that we need to be uh, your, our own little mini uh, wine expert. Mm -hmm. So I make the correlation to your five senses because wine enjoyment, wine tasting is a sensory event. So it's using all of your senses so I make that correlation on, so what does that mean when it comes to the five S's of wine tasting? So, so that's one of the portions 
of that evergreen class. And so I have the evergreen classes where you can buy it and go at your own pace. And then I have live classes where it's a, a Zoom type situation. There are other people in the class and I do a presentation according to whatever that subject is. And there, of course, are opportunities for one-on-one -on -one questions. And in that situation, people can learn from each other. You know, not only are you learning from me, but when there's opportunity for questions, um, the, the, the students can learn from each other as well. I love that wine is also a component to your online courses as well, because, um, you know, when you go to a networking event um, or if you're out like you're like you referred to previously about um, being out with clients, it's it is difficult if you don't know what to order or you don't know the price points of certain things. Um, wine can be a bit intimidating and you don't think about that as something that you would consider an etiquette or protocol, but it is an important factor. And so I'm, I'm happy that that's a part of your um, course. Yeah, Amber, and really, well, I started um, doing etiquette classes, just etiquette classes and protocol classes, and I would continuously get questions on, well, well, what about the wine, and where do I put the glasses, and how do I pair it with the food, and, um, you know, I would always get all these questions about wine. And I'm like, I'm trying to do one thing and people ask me questions about other things. Mm -hmm. So I literally started teaching myself more about wine. Mm -hmm. and, and then I had answers to my most frequently asked questions. And so I would keep getting the questions. And then one day somebody said, well, are you a sommelier? And I was like, no, but I can become one. So that's what I did. And that's what drove me to get my um, certification in wine. So, so that, I mean, it, you, that's the one thing about business, whatever the demand is and what people want to know more of. And if that's your core to teach, and actually I didn't say that my spiritual gifts one of them is teaching. So I love sharing knowledge. So this mm -hmm. is why this is just so important to be and so and then hospitality is as well as exhortation and exhortation is pretty much a big word for encouraging mm -hmm. so these things put together really makes the makes the person that I am and the the business that I do um you know I would do it if I if I didn't get paid it's one of those kind of things but of course you you've got to get paid in some ways just to keep the business going yeah but I really enjoy doing this because it is my core. That's what really drives, that's the driving force for me to, to continue this and to, to want to spread the knowledge. And I think that's what's so cool about your story in that, you know, we're talking about pivots. We're talking about a long career in one profession, and then you had an idea and it totally changed the trajectory of like another career. And I think one thing that, one theme that I keep hearing throughout this interview is that you're a continuous learner and that you have this love of teaching. And so going from, you know, pharmaceutical sales where you're not only learning about medicine, you're learning about product, you're working with different types of people and trying to close a deal. And then you're going into this space that's all about etiquette and protocol and how to order wine and the whole like on making an online class and a website and social media and marketing yourself is like a whole host of other things that you have to learn as well as an entrepreneur. And so I just want to know, um, were there any, like, what has been some of like your biggest challenges going from corporate to um, a full-time entrepreneur? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Amber. Well, the biggest challenge is, is really making myself known in this big wide world of the web. You know, you think it's such an opportunity because it's so many, but it's so many um, opportunities out there. Mm -hmm. So to differentiate myself is so huge and social media is so huge. Yeah. So, so that's where I've had to 
bring alongside experts to help me in that area. Um, in my, my corporate life, all I had to do, well, it was a big, huge thing, but compared to now what I'm figuring out, being a, wearing all the hats in a business, right? all I had to do was show up, you know? I just <laughs> didn't know what I knew. I didn't have to, to, to set the pace, get the list, um, do all the, the marketing pieces, in which I enjoy, though. I really I enjoy it. And, and if I would have stayed in corporate, I would have transitioned more into marketing mm -hmm. and my sales background. But, but wearing all those hats now as a business owner, and that's what the challenge is, is to make myself known and and getting abreast or with social media and how to make those those algorithms work and what that means yeah. and you know that's that's overwhelming to me you're speaking a huge truth right now in talking about being a business owner and wearing multiple hats and i think that there is a large amount of stress that comes along with that um but i i think that and I'm only saying this because I know you. So for the listeners, they're, they're just getting to know you. But I think one of the things you mentioned earlier was that you had to turn to the experts, the experts that know about the algorithms and how to market you and how to build your website. And I think that that's one thing that I you see where businesses flourish and where businesses fail based on who they hire as their team and the mm -hmm. people that are not... I don't smarter as like a lack of a better word, but more have more expertise in one area versus the other and how you can come together as a team to um, create this great brand and this, this great product. Who would you say um, have been your biggest influences or motivators uh, through this process? Mm. Um. I would say my biggest motivators, well, actually is my family, you know, um, my husband, he's been right there with me. He, he encourages me. He, um, helps me with a lot of my tech, you know, issues that I may have. He's the in-house um, IT guy. Yeah, he is the, he is the guy. And uh, <laughs> quite often he'll go with me to some of my classes and what that does allow is for us to have an engaging back and forth um for the students and um and it, it really I think it really is a quick learn for people to see um how an engagement can go wrong and or it could go right. He has been my biggest encourager and um just to especially because he can see me at my high point and then he can see me when I'm like second guessing mm -hmm. but um but he keeps me motivated and, and says you know this 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 is a good thing a good product and um you know keep pushing forward so um I love that you especially said family too because I know mm -hmm. that that that's something that we both share is how much we love we love our family mm -hmm. um, what would you say you love most about owning your own business? You know, the thing that I like the most is I can speak on things that mean the most to me. Mm -hmm. um, in representing other companies, manufacturers, I have truly enjoyed my pharmaceutical um, sales portion of my career. I love it. Um, at one point in that I didn't mention, but at one point I wanted to be a medical doctor mm -hmm. and, um, and I ended up going into business. And so what that job did was gave me the opportunity to, to do my marketing piece, my sales piece, my, my uh, interaction with the medical field. Um, so, so that was a way that I could get that going, but, but now that I'm in business for myself, mm -hmm. literally talk about the subjects that I want to talk about, you know, and yeah. 
that really brings me joy and represent the things that really mean the most to me. You know, the right presentation, doing things correctly, properly, with grace, with style. Um, that, those are the things that really mean a lot to me. And I can speak on those things in, in the way that I want to speak on them. Um, most uh, recently, I can do it with my blogs, on my website, the yeah. subjects that I want to talk about, um, the things that I have interaction with friends and either even um, um, folks that are, um, you know, my friends, just things that I interact or people I interact with, the things and subjects that they say or ask about or talk about, I can I can write about it and um, and bring it to them in a way that, um, you know, they can read about it. And so that gives me the opportunity to speak on things that matter to me and my optimal image. I, I think I was in a course right after college um, that taught, it, it was like a sales like boot camp sort of thing. And they taught us proper etiquette, you know, where how table placements, how to eat, like how to use the utensils, all of the things um, very similar to what you're offering with my optimal image. And I remember, um, you know, both of my siblings went to HBCUs and that's like one of the gen eds is like learning proper etiquette. But unless you're in like these sort of spaces, I don't think that everyone is being offered or everyone is being taught proper etiquette and protocol. And I know that in today's age, and I think you and I have talked about this before, is like, people don't even really sit at the dinner table anymore as families. Um, we've seen that change a little bit during the pandemic because everyone was home. So now more people are sitting at the dinner table than we were seeing prior to the pandemic. But why do you think it's so important for people to learn proper etiquette or to educate themselves on proper protocol and some of the services that you offer? Mm -hmm. Well, Amber, I think it's important because, well, like I've said um, already, it's just doing things in the proper form, in the proper way. Um, but sometimes, though, it, it it really can make a difference in winning and losing. And the way the reason I say that is, say, for instance, when you are in a job interview situation, okay, and I always mention to my students when in a job interview, quite often, if you're one of those can candidates that won the last two or three, mm -hmm. still is involved. You know, mm -hmm. lunch, they'll discuss some of some more of the intricacies about the position. They'll take you to dinner. But I'll, you know, I always make mention is not to feed you because they think you're hungry. You are still on an interview you still you still interviewing mm -hmm. and my golly you could be the smartest person but and it's going to be say two or three the smartest people you know the the people for this position but at that dinner at that dining situation if you end up uh eating the role of the potential manager's role you, you just don't know exactly how to manage and who's what and Where's the bread, the bread plate in the, if you don't know these things and you make a faux pas, that's really, it's like, wow, that could literally make the difference of the haves and the have nots, the one that has a job and the one that does not. <laughs> so, yeah. So it's very important to know things that are proper. And another thing that brings to my memory is I was conducting a an etiquette class and this class had adults as well as children in the same class. So one of the, the attendees was a prominent person here in Richmond. You would see her on TV. She was in the, um, in the um, lawmaking system. And um, and she said to me at the end of the class, she says, Lavetta, thank you so much for this because the position that I have, I should know proper etiquette. 
but I never learned it as a child. I never learned it as an adult. So thank you for this opportunity. So what would happen would be when the situation would come that a meal was going to be had, she would always excuse herself because she felt intimidated. Oh, yeah. In those uh-huh. positions. So she would excuse herself. But guess what? That's a lot of times where some big decisions are made over a meal. Yep. So if you if you acquiesce, if you say, oh, I, I've got something else to do, or people usually just come up with an excuse to cover for shortcomings, you know, that can really um, take you out of a situation that um, that could really matter most. So, I mean, it's always good to know the proper way to do things. And, and, and to be honest, Amber, when, when I guess now as, as I'm more in tune to the proper way to practice, just, and, and now I know that you know, and when you're at a restaurant, and you see people doing all kinds of weird, wacky things. <laughs> oh my goodness. Who, why didn't they learn how to manage themselves at the table? They need some my optimal image. <laughs> yeah. What what sort of advice do you have for people who are um, working remotely that may not have an opportunity um, on that last interview when they invite you out to a meal and that it's like, the, that last test before you get the offer. So they, they're not doing that anymore with some of this remote re- yes. remote work. So how can you still show etiquette in the remote sp- space? Right. And that, and that would be an opportunity where um, with my optimal image to do a one-on-one. And with that, things that, that are taught in a remote situation is really how to stage your background, how to sit correctly, how to know how to manage yourself, manage your eye contact and things like that um, remotely. Um, And knowing exactly just screen etiquette is Mm. what would come into play. Setting the stage to make it so your vision, your view is great. Um, like I said, no distractions and focusing in on how to, and literally how to dress properly, um, how to not, and to really be a lot of times things, just simple things like being fully dressed, mm-hmm. you know, not having the top on, but your your whole fully dressed body because that'll put you in that mindset of being in a position of command. It really depends on what position you are interviewing for, but setting the stage correctly to be in that position. And if you are communicating online, if that's a part of what you do, make sure that you're delivering that firsthand and on the screen. What would be your advice to other people out there who have left corporate and are looking to pivot into a new career or start their own business? Mm. The main thing, Amber, is to have a plan. (laughs) Have a plan before you make that move. Think about all aspects. Think about, um, you know, what First of all, it would be the best, the optimal thing would be to have a clientele or have a build, have, have already built a base before you make that transition and make the transition when your time is going to be best suited for your new business. So mm-hmm. when you get to the point where you don't, that your time is running short because you are showing up at somebody else's job, but financially you can, you are seeing the income from your new position Mm -hmm. and when the break even point happens, that's the time to make that transition. So plan it out, um, financially plan it, know exactly what what um, you need to to get those things that you need, your basic um, daily covering of life, 
you know, your food shelter, you know, make sure you have a budget in place and your new position, your new job, your new business can cover your business expenses as well as your personal expenses. So a plan, a plan, a plan in place and not just have it in place, but practice the plan. Thank you so much for joining us today. This was such a great conversation and um, I hope that you enjoyed it as well. Oh my goodness, Amber. Thank you so much for having me and my optimal image. And um, I hope your listeners do tune in to myoptimalimage.com and um, see the offerings that uh that they, that there are for them to increase their representation of themselves and um please go on the website and fill the contact list and and give some ideas on some things that um that that they may want to learn so i'm here that. to fulfill those needs that's awesome before you go i want to play a rapid fire game with you Okay, Amber. So I'm going to ask you a few questions and you just have to answer them in a sentence or two. Okay. Okay. So what's one lesson your job has taught you that you think everyone should learn at some point in life? Mm. Um, be willing to learn daily. You know, be open for new learnings, new opportunities know that um that you don't know it all and put yourself in an environment where there is room for improvement what is one etiquette tip that no one should ever forget thank you and please <laughs> be respectful that's the basic bottom line is to have respect for others as well as respect for yourself what is one etiquette tip that you find is underrated? Mm. Um, I would say treat others as you would want to be treated. That's, that's a basic etiquette uh, thing to live by. And it's so simple. And yet we don't do that. We just, we yeah. <laughs> oh no <laughs> oh lord if you could uh write a book what would it be about and why actually um if I could write a book it would be um a book about optimal daily learning and what I mean by that is um almost like a daily care or daily devotion or daily readings mm. on optimal living with the result of joy. Oh, I so, love that. Yeah. So I, I, I love to do op, just daily readings to start my day. Mm -hmm. And that's what it would be about. Oh, well, I hope that you are actually writing that book because... <laughs> I think that's a great one. Um, oh my goodness. Actually, actually Amber, the um, blogs that I write, uh, I've got that in mind. It's like, you know, just short, kind of short blurbs of what would bring joy of the day. Yeah. Do you have a favorite quote? Um, I would say my favorite quote would be, um, when you know better, you do better. Maya Angelou's, you know, and that's what my optimal image is based off of learning the best thing and doing it, applying it. Mm -hmm. And that's it. I love that. So entrepreneurship is a 24 seven job. So when you're not working on your business, what are you doing to provide self-care? Oh my goodness. Um, Actually, I make sure I have, um, I walk daily, five to six miles off on, I don't do it on Sundays. I do give myself grace on Sundays to just take a minute to 
do other things that bring joy, have standing appointments, a standing spa appointment, a massage appointment, yoga appointments, um, and make sure health-wise standing appointments. So my dental appointments, eye appointments, keep myself um, healthy. Yeah. Um, and make sure I set aside time for that. Yeah. And making sure that I have my date night every week. <laughs> I love and that. <laughs> so, so setting aside specifically time to do things that could be overlooked. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what brings me joy. And that's what I make sure I put into my regular schedule. And one more time, where can people find you? Oh, okay. Well, myoptimalimage.com is a website and I'm on Instagram and Facebook and um, TikTok. And, um, and my, my handle is at my optimal image. So please be on the lookout and you can find me there. Thank you, Lavetta. That's it for this week's episode of A Bright Idea. Tune in each week as we interview entrepreneurs to find out their aha moment that launched their businesses. Today's episode featured Lavetta Goldsboro, founder of My Optimal Image. You can support My Optimal Image by going to their website at myoptimalimage.com and on all social media platforms at My Optimal Image. We're building a community of support here at A Bright Idea, so follow My Optimal Image on social media, give a review, and tell all of your friends. Until next week, I'm Amber Key.